see our work. Make sure you got your uh, uh, hosting open. And of course our, our work, our assignment area open. And um, so where we're picking up on is we left off on um, our code review. And where we were with our code review is uh, basically we had gotten everything up. We got our assets folders, our resources, right? Our get ignore is actually started at this point. Um, we did our readme, so on and so forth, right? So you should match this. Yeah? Everybody with me on that? We went ahead and we dumped in quickly, I think in the end, we dumped in quickly our content. And actually, before I get rolling too quick here, one of the things I want to make sure that I do is, uh, so if I'm a developer and uh, I'm working on a team, somebody might have done work between the last time I worked on this project and now. And so one of the things I want to make sure of is that if anything is changed out there on the server, as long as it's not giving me um, a, an issue, uh, what I would want to do is come over here and do fetch all remotes and refresh uh, counters. And what that does, basically, is it just reaches out to the GitHub, right? And let's just say, out to the repository, let's use the right terminology, let's just say, um, Somebody else was working on the setup content branch, right? And in that branch, um, they edited this file, the README file. And I'm going to commit it to the setup branch, commit changes. And all I did was add that on, right? But what happens is if somebody made a change and I'm on this branch, if I do a fetch, what it should do for me, see how it's showing me? So it's saying, hey, I did the fetch, it went out and grabbed any history that happened, it's showing me that there's a pull, if I pull it, shows me that one file has changed, right? And there was one insertion, and it's the README file. And you can see right there's the change. So you can start to see how working as a team. Now, if there was a conflict, meaning if I change the address, and we'll do that, we'll slowly step into this thing, so it should be simple as we're moving forward. They would say, hey, resolve this conflict. Which which do you want? Do you want what you have or do you want the change? Kind of thing. So what I can do is I can come in here, get rid of that, save it. And you don't have to do this unless you did that with me. Commit it. push that change back up. Permission command. Oh, I think I'm using the wrong user maybe. And 
so at this point, if I refresh this, I'm in, I'm in the branch, if I refresh it, the changes applied. Make sense? Um, what's really cool is you can come in, right, and you can see the changes that have been made as well when you come in here and you look at it. You can view the history of the file, you know, what exactly has happened between one, one branch and another branch or one commit and another commit. Um, and that's where it really, uh, really becomes beneficial because when something goes wrong, you want to see what it is that changed and um, be able to identify, you know, what's wrong. Additionally, you can, in here, in Dreamweaver, you can show repository history and you can see all the commits that have been made and then you can click on it and it'll show you, right, so there's our initial commit and that's what we had in, inside here. Uh, we updated our readme and we can see what was added. You can see on our completed site setup we pushed all these files up. So of course it's going to show you all the changes that have happened to all those files. Um, it might seem a little overwhelming or confusing right now, but uh, honestly using, using these really uh, the history really gives you a, a great opportunity to quickly solve problems and get out of trouble before you get too deep into you know this spaghetti code mess of uh, collaboration and things like that. So we stopped, we were on our setup content uh, branch and what we need to do now is go ahead and make that branch a part of our master branch. And if you recall, we set up in here as well, we set up uh, GitHub pages as well to reflect, oops, wrong, wrong word, sorry. And that's currently where we're sitting on our master branch. And our server is sitting there as well. Right? So, all we've done, we've done locally, correct? Like everything that we've done is, has been local. I mean, outside of that. Because what we did do over here on our index page is we added all this content. And if we go out to localhost, Code review. Thought I had it running, sorry. Gets a little confusing between classes sometimes, right, when you're flipping around. So if I come out to localhost, I can see that where I'm at right now is where I want to be. And what I'm going to do now is go back to Dreamweaver. I've committed everything. Everything is good. You see we have our assets, folders, things like that, right? I'm going to click on Git. I'm going to go to, oops, sorry setup content, I'm going to switch to my master branch. And when I switch to my master branch, one way that I can confirm that it's actually switched is if I refresh localhost, I'll see that my file system is going back to what it was in master branch, right? Anybody needs to ask questions or needs me to slow down, it's okay, right? Have me do that. But what we want is all that work we did in set up content, we want that to now be a part of master. We're ready. We're ready for it to go to production. Right. So we come out, we select master because we always want to be on the branch that we're pulling a merge into. Right? And then I'm going to go to manage branches. I'm going to select set up content. And I'm going to say merge branch. Right. 
create merge commit even when the merge resolves. Uh, fast forward, which right we want we want documentation of when we've merged, so we want to allow it to do that. We're going to hit OK. Close. Done. And the way we can truly tell if it worked is go to localhost, refresh, and we can see that we are now working. All that we did in setup content has come over to the master branch. Right. Some people will delete their branches as they go. That's kind of silly, in my opinion, because the idea of having the branches is if something gets screwed up, you can go backwards, right, and, and kind of step back in time. Yes? So even if you merge that, it'll stay the same. You have to create a new branch if you want to start some working on something new. Or we're going to do that now. I'm going to just slowly, kind of, we're going to methodically kind of just keep working through things. And so once you want to merge something, then you're done with that branch for the most part. For the most part, you are done with that branch, yes, sir. Yeah, because your what will happen, it's called fast forward, right? Your master branch will progress along with other merges. And that one really, and that's why some people will delete that. I like having them as references. Right, and see what, you know, what was I thinking, what, what, what did I do. Along the way, someone might delete some comments or some files that we needed, and we can go find them in the, another branch, right? So it's just a nice safety net. Is really what it is. You just you kind of like number the branches you write and put the same name to it. Right, right. Well, you can number branches. You can do branches and, and name them in many different ways. Right. Um, a lot of times, the way you'll do branches is you'll be working on checkout page. You'll be working on the product page. You'll be working on login. You'll all be working on your own branches. So somehow the branch names will imply the functionality in the area that you're working on, right? Um, if you're independent, you might write, like in this case, you're doing code review, and if we're doing it independently, um, you might choose to, well, let's, let's, let's do that. First of all, let's finish our thought here. If, uh, well, yeah, you, you can, and I tend to do that, but it's kind of silly, and I tend to do it, but it's silly because everything's already dated. So why include that? You know what I mean? Um, what we want to do now is, is we want to push to Git our, our, our new master branch. So everything I do in the videos with you is a walk you through is in Commander, not in Dreamweaver, right? Um, but you're seeing how to do it in Dreamweaver, and I'm fine however you do it. Just do it correctly, right? Just get it done. Um, get it done correctly. If I come out and I look at my, my code review, is still the same, right? Because I haven't pushed to my server yet. If I go to my Git uh, pages now, that should reflect because it's pointed at the master branch, right? So now I can see this. Normally, in, a, in a, a, a live scenario, when we push the master, when we push it out to our repo, we're, we're about to do this step called deployment. Right? So we're about to deploy to production. And normally, the way that deploy to production can be done is one of two ways. And more so, it's starting to happen more and more that what will happen is we'll go to our server and we'll actually pull the code from the repository itself, rather than push it to the server. And the reason that we're doing that is if you do that consistently, over time, that safety net is there again. You know, like the one night we pushed out to Sony, 16 different servers, and it blew up their site. And there was something in it that blew up their site. And it was horrible, but it took us three minutes to revert because we were pulling from our repository. So all we did was go to the last right, previous uh, branch and bam, we were good. So, you know, there's all kinds of ways of doing it, but for now, the way that we're going to do it, and we'll get into deploying different deployment techniques later, um, for now, what we want to do is we want to go to our server, right, take a good, clean look at it. We want to inspect 
we always actually shame on me. I mean, I should have done this before I even pushed it up to the branch, but I didn't. We want to inspect and open up console. We want to refresh, and we don't want to just refresh, we want to empty cache and refresh. Sometimes you're going to get this error of favorite icon, and to be honest with you, Yeah, let's do it real quick. So we're like, wow, okay, we're ready for deployment to the server, right? We pushed up to our branch. Um, all is well. All of a sudden, we QA comes back and says, whoa, 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 whoa. You forgot their favorite icon. You forgot to put their, their icon in. Um, so let's do this together. Before I push it to my production server, I want to... I, want, I don't want this error. I want to make sure that error is not there. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to open a new window. We're going to type in favorite icon generator. I'll share the link when I pick one here in a second for you. I think that's the one. Let me see. No, I don't want to get too complex yet. I'm, okay, so I'm going to use this one. Favorite icon dash generator coming out to Slack now. If 2015. <coughs> what is a favorite icon? Well, right there is a favorite icon. Right there is a favorite icon, right? It's that little thing that shows up in our tab that is kind of like part of our brand identity. Um, go open another tab type in constitution I thought some poop stuff was going to come up there um, go to images because we don't want to spend a lot of time on this okay go to more I mean to uh, tools size icon and we're just going to steal something from somewhere Now, like a true web developer, I'll show you how crazy you are. I'm going to save image. And I'll share this one out with you if you don't want to, right? And I'm going to save it right into my... Right into my images folder, right in my project. Which is why I say... You know, it's always a good idea, which I don't have it up here, code review, but I should have code review up there. That's what I'm working on, so I have it in my quick access, so I can always get to, right, what I'm going after. Meaning, uh, if I go to HT Docs, I take code review, I put it up there. Now, when I go to get stuff, I know exactly where I go, where I'm going, what I'm going, you know what I mean? And I can go to my images, and I'm going to save that there. And I'll share this image with you if you want. I'm going to show you real quick. Uh, as a web developer, this is one of the dangers. The more you know, right, the, um, the more dangerous you are. I'm not going to do that. I was going to go and edit it real quick because I like it when it's perfectly round. And so I was going to um, make the outside of the circle, get rid of it. Uh, but I don't have the software I like to use to do that. So we're just going to be happy with what we have. We're going to go to our icon generator. 
again because I have it on my quick view, right? Quick access makes life a little easier. I'm going to go grab my icon image. I'm going to open it. Let's not overcomplicate things and let's just say generate for 16 by 16 favorite icon. Create. There's our favorite icon. So download the favorite icon. Before anything else, I'm going to make sure that that goes where it's supposed to go. So I'm going to drag it. I'm going to go into code review. <coughs> I'm going to take it from code review and leave it right here in the root. All right. Some people will put it in their images folders, things like that. I like it in the root. And we'll clean it up later if we feel that we need to. It generated the code for us that we want. So I'm going to copy the code. Did I lose anybody yet? OK. All right, that's because you didn't select the generate only the 16. Right? So what you want is that image in this code. I just put it in Slack. We're going to go back to Dreamweaver. And, yep. No, but you've got to create an icon with it. So the smaller the image is, the better off. You can use whatever you want. But you'll see the smaller the image because it's going to make it this tiny little thing to put up there. And you'll start to get creative with it. And it also shows transparency, which is why I said I wanted to go trim the, the outside so it showed as a perfect circle. But I don't want to waste class time doing graphics. Although it's real easy to waste time doing graphics, right? Now, if you look, I threw the favorite icon in there. And it's saying, wait a minute, that's untracked and my other image. and so what we really need to do is get the hell out of master. So we're going to go to manage branches. And we're going to say, and so this is an example where we would say, we'll name our branch So I'll call it fav icon imp for uh, implementation of the favorite icon, right? I'll just fav dash um, icon dash Imp, imp to me means implementation, meaning do it, right? I'm going to say OK. And then done. Does anybody need me to slow down, answer a question, or anything like that? At this point, I'm going to commit these files to this branch. Added image files for favorite icon. Say OK. I don't necessarily need to do a push yet. Right? I'm not done doing my work. I, I know I'm one, one ahead of the branch, meaning that's what that one means. It means I'm one ahead of where my GitHub repository is now. I've done something different. If I switch back now, if, do you notice the image files disappear? Because they weren't committed. They weren't, they weren't tracked in the master branch, which is what we wanted. We want them here until we're sure we have <coughs> what we want, right? I'll open up the index file. And I know that my favorite icon links normally will go somewhere in, somewhere in here, um, preferably before your style sheet. And I'll paste that code in, and I'll hit save, and I'll go out to my local host. Might not see it. Inspect. Empty cache. Feed icon, feed icon.
So this is one of those where I'm going to go ahead and assume that right now what's happening is it's a cache issue, right? I know the code is, is <coughs> correct. I feel comfortable with the code. I'm going to commit it. Added code for save icon. And now you can see I'm too ahead of the branch, right? I'm going to close it. I'm going to push my branch up. I'm good there. I'm going to go check GitHub. I can see that my five, my fave icon, IMP um, branch was pushed up. I can see it right here. I can see that my files are in there, right? The files that I added. There's the fave icon. There's the assets images. There's the image I used to make the icon. I'm bothered, honestly. I'm bothered why we haven't swapped out up there. Um, I'm going to just check that one more time and see. It should work. So I'm going to try to get rid of that. It really shouldn't matter. But it does. See how it changed the favorite icon up there? So the relative path wasn't... The server is substituting that back, that forward slash. We don't need it to look at our root on this server. That's awesome, right? So now I know I have it right. So I'm going to go back in. I'm still in my fave icon and branch. Haven't done anything to production, which is great, right? Everything's safe with production. I'll get rid of those forward slashes. I'll hit save. Just in front of fave icon on these two. I got rid of the forward slash. Hit save. Go anti cache and look at my site again. I'm going to go ahead and put it on console as well because, right, I don't want any errors. And at this point, my icon's up there. I'm good. No errors. I'm error-free. Anybody need me to pause for a minute? We're good. I'm going to close my index. I'm going to do yet another commit. Corrected leading forward slashes in fave icon path. And then I might even put like remove. Why would that be important for me to put that in there? Anybody know? Because as developers, we're pretty stupid sometimes. And we'll spend an hour writing amazing code and then three hours trying to fix something like forward slashes in our path because we can't figure it out because we look past that. And so when another, when someone else reads this or something, or when we push it to production, maybe it doesn't work because it requires forward slashes because that's configuration. The more information you have to kind of go down through and, and kind of troubleshoot, like, hmm, why isn't that working, why isn't that working, right, without clicking into things, the better you are. And so with your commits, you can read the commit lines kind of like in a list, and you can start to get an idea of, like, what's wrong. Yes, sir? So in our repo, um, how do we view the uh, commits that are Did you 
switch to your branch in your repo. Right? Yeah. To save icon dot imp. What do you mean? Uh, it should show up here, right? Yeah, it's saying. Okay. And then I need to do that in another web page to see the save icon. So right now, we're working off of, like if I did it here in the GitHub thing, it's not going to show because that's pointing a master branch. I need to point that out there. Hang, hang on, right? So we see it only on local host because our local host branch is pointed to the save icon. Does that make sense? Right? If I go in and change that, hang on, let me finish this commit real quick, uh, this uh, commit. So if I go in and I flip this to master, am I going to see the favorite icon out here? No. Right? Because it's not, it's not merged into master yet, correct? But if I go into the branch, I see it. Okay. Am I answering your question? Yeah. Right? So now I see it because I've, I'm now my fi my local file system is, has that branch in it, the files, right? That's what it's showing inside the folder. I guess what I'm asking is um, on the repository, uh, on GitHub, you have the favorite icon branch. So, like the, uh, I don't know, the like what's the local host. Uh -huh. um, you can do that in a web page. How do you view the local, or the, how do you view the repo branch? Um, so we'd have to go change GitHub pages. Okay. okay. Right? We'd have to point, so right now our GitHub pages are pointed at our master branch. Okay. So, and, and sometimes you might want to do that. So, but what you'd have to do is come in here, and it could wonkify things us for a little while, but you know, you could come in and you could, you know, pick another another place to point it to. Okay. But at the end of the day, this is intended for, right, for your master branch, really, is what it comes down to. Yeah. Um, so at this point, we know it works good. We got rid of the error. We feel comfortable. We'll push our fave icon to the repo. My branch is clean, right? And everything should should be up here. Less than a minute ago, right? It's showing me. Um, and what I meant about the commits, like say something's going wrong, what's cool is you can come up here and commits and you can read down this list. And so like someone might be struggling with what we just experienced with favorite icon and they're going to like look at that and yeah, after uh, as time goes, you start to know what you're looking for and looking at, and where flags are. You know, like how things look. So we'll go back. We're on our favorite icon branch. What do we want to do next? Anybody? Merge the branches. How do I do that? Get it in master. If you're being thorough, when I switch to the master, honestly, especially if I'm working on, on a big dollar job, I'll come out, I'll refresh local host just to see where I'm at so I can right, see the changes take place. I'm in my master, merge branches, favorite icon, merge the branch. done. If I come out here to code review, I get my favorite icon. The error is gone. I'm clean. Because of that, I feel comfortable pushing. I've pushed it out 
to GitHub's my updated master branch, which means I should be able to go to my GitHub view, refresh, refresh, inspect, clear cache, refresh, it's not showing me my code in there, let's go back to master, make sure the push was good, right, so I can see the push was good, the favorite icon was there, I can click on my index.html file and I can see that my code is in there. So it might just take GitHub pages a little longer to update, and there we go. So point and lesson there, right, like don't immediately knee jerk when something isn't happening the way you expected it, and you will, and you'll experience like me many times, even still, you actually create a problem because you just didn't wait to see the code, right? kind of update and cache to clear and things like that. So you've got to be really careful. Um, sometimes you'll go out to try to fix a problem that does not exist. So I've tested it here. I know I'm good. I feel good about where I'm at. Um, my repository is all up to date. I have, now I have three branches. Um, and what I can do at this point I feel comfortable, made it through QA, now it's time for me to update my server. Updating my server in um, Dreamweaver, I'm going to switch over here. I always want to be on master when I'm updating my server. I'm going to switch over to files and folders. I'm going to right click on the root of the site and I'm going to say synchronize. Synchronize entire code review site. We're going to say get and put newer files, meaning if there's a newer file on the server, we're going to pull it down. If there's a newer file on my machine, I'm going to push it up. Delete remote files not on local drive, not advisable. And then I'm going to click preview. going out to the server and it's checking file against file on my machine and on the server and deciding like, hey, what has changed? And then it's deciding for me, it's letting me know, hey, this was added, so let's put it. This was added, so let's put it. I'm going to say, I don't want my git ignore up there. So I'm going to right click on it and say ignore selection and see how it said to put that there. I want that up and I want that up, right? So I'm going to say OK. It's now putting those things up there. Remember how we clipped the readme? So if I go here, Right, if I click on local view and go to remote view, I always do a refresh. I right click in here and say refresh remote files because I don't trust it. See how the readme is not up there? Do you know what I mean? Now we don't want that dot git up there, so what do we do to that? So it's not a part of reindeer games anymore. What do we do? in Dreamweaver. What can we do in Dreamweaver to make it that that file does not go up to the server? Nobody? What? Cloak. We're going to cloak it. That way next time we do a uh, site synchronization, it ignores that file. Because we don't want that going up to Dreamweaver. I mean up to our website. At this point, we should be able to go test our live site, our production. We call it our production site. 
empty cache, load, and there it is. We know our JavaScript's working because we get this console log. Remember we put the console log in, right? We know that the style sheet is linked nice, uh, correctly because we have the background color and the text colors changed. Make sense? And this is the point where you would start working on right on creating this. Now, unfortunately, we don't have class two today. And um, not next week, but the following week, I go to Washington, D.C. for the week. I, I got a, um, a grant that I have to go and speak for to for the white development for my and for the security. And so Linda Bell and I are going there for the week. I'm going to get a drunk every night. <laughs> all, that, all I have to do is open a beer and blow it out. She's a drunk. She's adorable. That's my mom. She is my, she is my replacement mother. Um, so what I'm, what I'm doing is planning out for that week that I'm not here uh, what I would like to see you guys do. I can't get to you. But I will give you, you know, a pretty hefty assignment for that week. What I'd like to see you come in for a together for a prospect and not to use it. Um, help each other out. And things like that. So I, we, we'll talk more about that Thursday and next Thursday, but we don't have class next Tuesday. Um, with that said, not having class next Tuesday, I, I would be happy at this time to meet on a Google Hangout anybody who wanted to do something. Um, the school is closed, so but I'll be at home and I'd be more than happy to hop on and, and do whatever. So here's your choice. Where do we go today with all that information in mind, right? Where, where do we go from here? Do you want me to work on code review a little bit and kind of show you some thoughts and ideas? Right now, your code review is acceptable to submit. If you worked along with me and you did this, Right now, I would say it's acceptable to submit um, because you're going to keep building on it. You know what I mean? You're going to keep uh, throughout the class as we run through this. We are getting into Bootstrap. Our CDN, we'll talk about that. Um, but we're getting, we're going to dive into Bootstrap and jQuery a little bit. So there's, as a, what I'd be happy to do, as a, all these, by the way, down here as we get into our project, um, honestly, I don't think that I can make it any easier for you um, as far as like walking through project steps and things, because like I said, let's review this real quick before we make the choice on what we're going to do. Um, I will go through and update these a little better for you all. Uh, meaning, you know, I'm going to try to break these, like my newer ones, real quick for you. But, right, like, obviously, introduction is the beginning of the video, um, but then set up your environment. What I do in every one of these videos in the beginning, actually, let me do it like this. In every one of these videos, uh, each step, I, it always starts off with making a branch. And then, each one of this, the making a branch videos, what I try to do for you is just kind of be like, okay, I'm, I'm getting ready to code. Here's the things that I'm opening and making sure are there so I don't have to go running after them when I'm in the middle of coding, so on and so forth. I can't tell you all to submit help tickets, but if I were paying money to be in school and taking a web development class and the internet was like for like, AOL, 14K, I would be submitting help desk to the complaints about the internet. Just, just saying. Um, so, so that goes that goes to that, right? And then, like, just so you know, like, don't feel like I'm trying to treat you stupid. Some of you will be very grateful. Some of you will be like, what, what is this thing? I'm an idiot, right? It, we're all at different places. But the point is, is I walk you through every little step, every little step. So if you follow these videos. You should not get lost. Um, 
So we made our branch, we're ready to work, right? That's how that video ends. Okay, we're ready to work, we're ready to roll. And then this next video will come in, maybe. Maybe not. So this next video will come in and you'll see, right? View your current branch in Dreamweaver. Update code and head for site. Uh, add your website link in comment. Uh, meta viewport, right? Like every little step. Don't be overwhelmed when you look at that list, because some of these are just separated by three seconds, five seconds, ten seconds. But what it, the reason I did it this way is so that you're able to look at it and and be comfortable with, right? Like, okay, next step. Oh, there it is. Oh, I forgot this. Where do I? Oh, yeah. Git commit. How do I do a git commit again? I know I got to do that. You know, so that you're able to kind of walk through stuff. Uh, without getting overwhelmed. That's the idea. All the code that you need will be right in here. So I'm hoping that that positions you for, right, for good success. That's my primary, my primary goal with you. Um, so with that said, and in this one, right, the step example. What are we? What are you doing in here? Well, this step is where you're, you're building basically the beginning of your web app. And that's what your end product for what your assignment is right now for next week is in there. So the point is what I'm what I'm presenting to you is would you like me to spend a little time in code review and maybe lay out bootstrap in there or something for you since that's what we're talking about and show you how to do that? Or would you prefer I kind of jump ahead to the assignment and go through that before you get it started. Anybody? Nobody? No preference? None? Alright, let's go, let's do code review right now real quick and get Bootstrap in there for you. Alright? And jQuery. And give you a little introduction before you start reading about it and watching videos about it and stuff like that. Good? We can get rid of these guys. And actually, I'm just going to keep this window because what I'm going to do is get bootstrap.com. Put it in Slack just in case you're lost. They have the version, right, latest version of Bootstrap is 4.3. We're going to get that one. And the way that we're going to get that is we're literally just going to come in here and copy the links that they get us. When you only need Bootstrap compiled CSS or JS, you can go use the Bootstrap CDN. So what that means is the Bootstrap CDN, what that does for us is it gives us these files that we need um, in order for Bootstrap to work inside of our website. We're going to grab all these files, so we're going to grab this one first, which is the style sheet. We're going to copy it. We're going to come into Dreamweaver, and what do we need to do before I get all excited and start doing things? Make a new branch. So I'm going to manage branches. I'm going to put adding libraries dash bootstrap comma jQuery. I'm going to hit OK. Oh, I can't put commas in my name, so dash can't have spaces in there either. Back a thousand, aren't it? We hit OK. Done. So now I'm in that branch, right? And I'm ready to get working. I'm going to open up my index.html file. 
and that link that I copied for Bootstrap, the style sheet, I'm going to put it above my main CSS. Does anybody know why? Anybody have any guesses why? No? Because sometimes, right, Bootstrap, as we'll see, we'll take a look at it then, but Bootstrap is this, right, this huge CSS sheet and it will do things like the second if I hit save and I come out to my local host and I refresh do you notice how there's a difference in fonts a little bit of sizing difference a couple things changed up on me right the reason is is because what's happening Right. So if I go in here and I view page source and I click on this bootstrap style sheet and open it, I mean, that's all the styles, all the CSS that we're getting from bootstrap. And so this would be a library. And what, what, what's so awesome about this is when I started doing this, you didn't share code with anybody because your clients would get pissed off. Like, I'm paying for that code, you know, let anyone use it, blah, 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 blah. Well, as we slowly started to realize, hey, when we share code, an 18-month project becomes a three-month project. So what's more important to you, your know, do you, do uh, you want me to write this a little different, what everyone else is doing? You want me to rename things just so you can feel good about your code? Or do you want me to keep you consistent with the rest of the world so when there's an update, we can just pull it in and take advantage of it? You know, and so that's where um, coding, especially web apps, really started to evolve because all of a sudden we were able to share our stuff and get stuff from other people, and that's where like GitHub became huge because you'd start working on a project and someone who was really good on CSS was like, "Hey, I really like what you're doing. I'm not a I'm not a, a JavaScript person, but I." I write slam in CSS, I'm going to make a contribution in CSS, and next thing you know it, you, you're, you're evolving, right? And even when people are making contributions, you are, um, you are uh, able to leverage other people's code because they want to put it out there. But, so like Bootstrap, right, you can see Bootstrap is pretty much a touching everything. And when I say everything, I mean you know, every element, every style that we use in the browser or whatever, and a good example of that is we can see our H, right, our headings, and not only can we see our headings, but, you know, we can see that the headings, so here in this case, it's actually going after the headings, um, the H tags. Here, it assigns styles to headings. So you can see how there's this dot, 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 right? Here you can see it's going after heading one. Um, so Bootstrap is essentially, it's going in and pretty much, and we know this for a fact because up here where it says root, it's basically saying you just wipe out any styles existing before me and use what I'm showing you. So that's what's happening with Bootstrap then. When we have our main CSS in, Right, right now, all we have is body, background, color, and color, which is our background and our fonts are white. Now, we saw in there about the headings, right, the H1s. So, a good example of the point as to why you want to keep your style sheet after Bootstrap is because CSS goes, right, as it reads, it'll overwrite things. And so we know that the H1 tag in Bootstrap is 2.5 EM. We'll talk EM, REM as we move along. But if I open this up and I come in and I say H1, H1, font size. And I say 10. Zero. I think I think they were using EM or REM. Does anybody remember? We'll find out.
heat slowly along. So you can see that's getting applied. That's why. But if I were to take my style sheet and pull it in above, you get nervous when I do this shit because stuff changes sometimes and you're like, oh, I'm wrong. Notice what happened. It wiped out all my styles. Right? Because it came, Bootstrap came in after it and had explicit assignments to those selectors and to those rules and therefore trumped my styles. So again, if I put my style sheet down here after, those will override the bootstrap styles. As a developer, one of the things that you really want to do, in my opinion, if you're going to use a library like Bootstrap, right, is only override when you have to override. Only override when you have to override. Because what you're trying to do is take full advantage of this library so you don't have to write code. But what we do as developers, we get so anal and pretentious that we end up trying to overwrite the very library that we were was giving us the freedom to move faster, if that makes sense, right? The next part of Bootstrap is we want to, and as you notice, we don't have to use the script for Bootstrap, the JavaScript, but that's when you really get the full advantage. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to grab JS, Popper JS, and jQuery. Popper JS is what allows like there's cool like hover over instead of it just like showing this line of text it actually looks you know nice and whatever. jQuery is just slamming and we'll, as we'll learn in a minute. So by the way in my main CSS, I got rid of my styles. Alright? You don't have to. At this point, we're creating, right? We're, you're, you're on your own as far as what you want to do. I'm putting my code in, and I'm going to come all the way down here to the bottom of the page. Where's my main? I needed to move my main down to the bottom of the page too, by the way. Which I'll do in a minute. And I'm going to paste those three lines of code in. And then I'm going to go up here to the top. And I'm going to take my main JS, by the way, and I'm going to move that down where it belongs at the bottom of the page. And I'll explain that in a second. And I'm actually going to do it just like I did with my CSS. I'm going to put it after my libraries. I'm going to hit save, and then actually I'm going to clean my code up, apply source formatting. So my indentation is clean, right? Everything is, is clean and looks good. I'm showing my hierarchy. I'm going to come out to my empty my cache, check my console, make sure I'm not throwing any errors, right? And then, because I'm using these libraries, the next thing I might do is come in here, look at network, and actually we could do sources. And I just want to make sure that my files are loading, right, the way I think that they are, which they look good. 
if I go into page up here, what I can see is that like jQuery, we're calling in that jQuery library, that's loading. The bootstrap, I can see that that's loading. And look at what all it's loading. I mean, it's not just loading, you know, one file. It's loading all types of, of data and files and things like that. This will make more and more sense to you as we go. Don't get overwhelmed. Honestly, I could still allow myself to get overwhelmed after doing this 20 some years, right? Uh, there are times where I try to like React. There was a library out there called React. And holy crap! You know, I need I need a good month of solid couple hours a day to be able to sit down and really learn React correctly. But it gets easier as you go. So we have these two libraries. We'll focus on these two libraries right now. that we've just loaded into our constitution. I'm going to go to the jQuery API in Slack. So what is, first of all, what is API? What does API mean to us? What is an API? Anybody know? application program interface, right? And so it has such broad, it has such broad um, definitions today, but at the end of the day, that's really what API stands for. And so API uh, has gone, you know, taken on many different shapes, but um, at the end of the day, it's just like a small, application that we can interact with through an interface, right? And so, as we'll learn, we'll do a lot of that interacting through REST APIs, which are endpoints that we just call and we get data and information from and stuff like that. Um, jQuery started out, so like I said, back in the day, we started, uh, and we started doing, and jQuery unfortunately is, is struggling right now because of uh, other libraries like React and um, um, Vue, and there's there's a couple out there. But jQuery was the first, is still the biggest, will still be around when you get into the industry because millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of websites using it. And I have a feeling like any other uh, library, API, uh, they, they kind of they're the greatest, they're the greatest, and then something comes along, and then that happens, right? Like it's just this, this thing. And so honestly, at the end of the day, my opinion is this. You pick one, you learn it, you learn it well, you figure it out, and you'll make it do more than 90% of the people using the other ones because they're the jumpers. They're the ones who try to go from girlfriend to girlfriend to girlfriend to girlfriend. They never get married, right? And then you run into them in their 40s and 50s and uh, low life, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't mean it like that, but actually, now that I'm getting divorced, I should rate in exactly what I... Anyway. <laughs> um, what's cool is, so again, back in the day, jQuery is JavaScript. And back in the day, we had to write a lot of JavaScript, and we had to write it over and over and over again. And we had to not only write it over and over again, but we had to write the same thing three different times because Internet Explorer and Netscape and Firefox and Chrome and whatever, right? It wouldn't work in everything. And so you had to do all these different things. And so these two guys in a garage, like 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 our computer people, like Jobs and Wozniak and you know what I mean? Um, Pumps, college I don't even think they were college students. They decided that they were going to stop focusing on writing web apps, uh, web pages, and take all these common things that we do with JavaScript and put them into this one library so that you can just call things, right? Like instead of writing six lines of code, call app. 
and there's six lines of code are in there. And not only are there six lines of code are in there, but they're also conditionally and logically written that it's actually 28 lines of code, but it identifies what browser, what version, and how to deal with it because of that browser and that version. And all of a sudden, it was magical because we can stop writing all this code and just call functions, right? Call these, these functions that are in this library. And I can remember when uh, the one Adobe Mets I went to, when the two guys, this was maybe 10, 11 years ago, um, these two guys wrote this library. It got traction. Adobe loved it. And they handed them a check for like $40 million on the stage at Adobe Mets, which was amazing. Even more amazing, because they made it open source, which is what helped it evolve, Adobe was one of the first major, major players to purchase something for such an enormous amount of money and said, yeah, but we're still going to make it free. We're, we're going to keep it open source because we wanted to keep growing, right? Um, what they really wanted was the rights to use it any way they want, which is why the purchase was there, and also to control the quality a little bit because the two guys did an amazing job, but two guys trying to manage this, coders, we're not very good at organizing anything but food, right? You know, mm -hmm. um, they. So it really, it, it really took off, and so almost any site you go to today, I promise you, it's slowly flipping a little bit because there's some other contenders out there, but um, it's very rare that you'll hit a site that's not using jQuery in some capacity. And so again, what jQuery does for us is. All these are functions. And so we understand what a function is in, in coding. Yes? No? Everybody? No? Yeah? I'm going to have to assume no. All these are functions. What do I mean by a function? Right. So I'm going to open up my main JS. And before I even do anything with jQuery, I'm going to show you this. See how we have console log, and so the way the JavaScript works, just like HTML, just like um, CSS, the browser opens it, it reads it from left to right, top to bottom. And so whatever it reads, right, it makes happen. Well, see how we have that console log, JavaScript main is loaded? Um, maybe we don't want that to automatically just appear the way that it does. Right? I load the page, it pulls in JavaScript, it reads it, it sees that, it's like execute it, do it. If I create a function And I move this into this function, and I hit save, and I go out, and I empty my cache, and I load it again, and it's not there. Right? If I come over here and I say, run that function, it runs it. So what a function does for us is it allows us to take what we call a code block. And a code block can be a lot of different things, by the way. But the thing that you really want to focus on a code block is those curly braces. So that's considered, right, that's considered a code block right there. Whatever's inside there is considered a code block. A function is a code block that has a name and we can have unnamed functions too, but we, we'll just stick with this right now, right? Um, we can, uh, has a name to it, and so whatever's inside of that function will only be executed if we call it, right? Additionally, we can do things like
reading you something called a parameter. And with that parameter, we can pass additional information to that function So if I go page page downloading, right? It calls that function. Oh, I gotta refresh, sorry. Page downloading, it calls the function. If I say if I put that in there, page downloading, do you see how it appended it to the end? where I called it. So this is called an argument and it's an argument to the parameter. The parameter is treated like a variable and therefore it gets filled with right that information that I passed to it. Does that make sense? If anybody needs to talk it through, that's good and fine, right? Like. jQuery is just a bunch of these functions that we're telling it to do. Another thing, and we're just getting right, we're just introducing ourselves to some things here and, and um, warming up to some things. One of the cool things in the browser is every time it does something, we call it an event. In the browser, we'll report back to us every time something happens, including taking our mouse across the screen, right? We can set up a function that says, every time the mouse moves, let me know the XY coordinates. And we can drag our mouse across the screen, and we would see our console log of, right? Because it would just, every pixel it moved, the browser would report back and call that function. So we have these things called event listeners that we can talk to the browser and we can say, hey browser, when this window loads completely, I want you to call this function. Did I get that wrong? Call me silly. Window load. Did it just load? Yes. You'll see me do this a lot. You gotta check yourself. Right? Yeah, window on load. Oh. Let's see if that works. There we go. I just screwed it up. That's all right. Because the window loaded, right, I called this function, and I think we can put a parameter, parameter in it, and we could say window window and we see window and the reason I did that is because I want to show and demonstrate that every little thing that loads we can stick a I don't know if it's going to let me do body no, it's going to force me to do at the end. So I don't want to leave you confused. Know that we can do this with body and we can do it with window. 
Well, no, we can actually do it with body. I'm just having brain farts right now. Like, we actually can do it literally with body. But these are the things, right? This is the secret sauce to, to making web pages applications. It's the JavaScript. When you put a mouse over something, and also an image changes that to listen, right? It knows that the mouse is now from the point of the over. Exactly. And then it creates a video. Right? Exactly. And as we learn more and more, we'll see that we can, you know, we can track the events. We can see all types of, of different um, uh, ways that we can interact with the user. And then interact with uh, what's that called after we put the HTML and put it into the browser? What's it become? The DOM. Right? You'll be fine. Don't get.